Are you ready for a reboot? Welcome to the Sheila Mack Show, reality at its finest. History reminds us those hit hardest often become the change makers. This year, we've all hit crazy economic, social, and emotional rock bottoms. We all get knocked down. Something hits globally, locally, personally. It affects our health, finances, our relationships. We have to recreate a business or career. Each show, Sheila and her special guest will be sharing their reboot stories, guiding you with real solutions to upgrade and up-level emotionally, mentally, physically, spiritually, and financially. Here on NBC's KCAA Radio, if you're ready to pull yourself up by the bootstraps and bra straps, enjoy a listen. Here's Sheila. If you are just tuning in, welcome to the Sheila Mack Show. This is Sheila Mack, your host, and you are tuning in to NBC's Sheila Mack Show right here on KCAA Radio, the station that leaves no listener behind. I'm your host, Sheila Mack, and today I'd like to give a special thank you and shout out to Mel Science for today's episode sponsorship. Now, this episode is all about parenting and education for our children. So one of the things that I loved about Mel Science is that Mel Science is a subscription service that offers monthly science boxes which combine hands-on experiments with VR and AR technology to engage kids in studying science. They are breaking the stereotype that science is boring, difficult, and only for certain types of people. Mel Science strives to make serious science accessible interesting and cool for all. So now personally, oh, I actually did order and have two boxes, two different science kits that we got to learn with at home. And I, I was really impressed. Now I have raised six children of my own and I also was a um, Montessori teacher for many years. I, I do highly recommend this this program and I I only wish that I knew about male science when my little ones that are now grown were little so this is now for grandchildren. Uh so Mel Mel Kids is a program that's available for children ages 5 to 9 plus. They have 18 STEM do-it-yourself projects, new topics every month delivered to your door, yet it's not parents don't worry it is not do it yourself it is actually augmented reality science lessons free in the mel kids app and there's free online lessons with professional science teachers your children will be learning through story time storytelling and it'll be fun so that's what i love the most about it now as your children progress there is mel physics and that's for ages 8 to 14 there's 18 exciting physics sets two to three new experiments in each box with a new physics topic every month free vr lessons in the mel vr app that takes learning to a whole new level and a free online lesson with a professional science teacher or teachers and then as you move on mel chemistry is for ages 10 to 16 plus there's a free starter kit with a free vr headset that comes with your first box and it is a monthly prepaid subscription there are 24 chemistry sets uh, free VR lessons in the Mel Chemistry app and two to three new experiments on a new chemistry topic every month. So you can, no matter what your child's age is, you can start plugging science into your routine. If you are homeschooling right now, this is, I can't recommend this enough for homeschooling parents. And also, this is a wonderful gift. Uh, grandparents, if you want to give a gift that keeps giving every month then and will bring so much education to your child this is something i do highly recommend now if you would like to order you can go to melscience.com and with that right now anybody tuning in 
just use the code Sheila, capital S, all caps, S-H-E-I-L-A, and you will receive 60% off your first month of the Mel Science. And for those tuning in, this is a special episode. So today we have an author that writes books about entrepreneurship, and we'll be learning more about how to educate our children in entrepreneurship. And later on in the show, I will share about the Mel Science giveaway, so your children and family will have the option of winning a Mel Science kit as well. All right, so tune in for that, and now we're going to get started. Today, we have a very special guest. We have Timothy Bauer. He is the author and illustrator of many children's books, including Lucas the Dinosaur Entrepreneur. Billy the Dragon, and Harper Hears No and a whole bunch more. He is the founder of Dinosaur House, a company that makes kids books for entrepreneurs. He also hosts a variety of podcasts such as The Literacy Advocate, B2B Growth, The Purpose Driven Entrepreneur, Writing Better, and The Up and Coming Illustrator. Timmy's contributing writer artist for the Children's Writers Guild magazine. While the kids' books author career was taking off, Tim, Timmy was also also a Disney actor. I love it. <laughs> Man, you're reading the whole thing. <laughs> and Timmy's dream is to make books that ignite a love for reading in kids while inspiring them to think about grown-up topics like entrepreneurship, finance, and personal values. Outstanding. Well, welcome to the show, Timmy. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me, Sheila. I'm excited to talk to you. Now, this show actually started off when I was interviewed by someone else on this network, and that was about my best-selling book, Bootstraps and Bra Straps, the formula to go from rock bottom back into action in any situation. And this last 12 months, globally, we have had every situation show up. And so I like to have maybe if you could share to the listeners a time in your business or personal life where you hit a tough situation and how you got back on track. Sure. Okay. So um, I have two that jump out uh, and I'll just share both of them and you can tell me which one you find more interesting or which one you'd rather talk about. But uh, two things that have happened. So uh, 2019, I was uh, touring as a kids book author. I've been touring. Uh, I decided I wanted to be a kids book author professionally a long time ago, went out and finally just started in 2014 and have been busting my butt to try to get to a place where I can fully support myself on money that I'm making as a kid's book author. It's taken a lot of work. Uh, I finally got there in 2019 when I realized, oh, wait a second. If I'm just always traveling uh, and I'm visiting elementary schools literally every day, uh, mm -hmm. I can make a full-time living as a kid's book author. <laughs> so that's what I was doing. Um, I was just making trips all over the U.S., uh, visiting elementary schools and I'd have a whole routine that I put together to get parents uh, to, to notice me and to take an interest and see if they want to buy my books. Um, and it was going really well. Uh, I quit my jobs and I was like, yes, this is working. I was so excited. Um, and then surprise, surprise. I mean, COVID hits. And uh, uh, so 20, uh, early 2020, I was on tour and I was like, that's when we were all kind of like, it was over in China and we're like, what's going to happen? Is it coming to the US? And nobody really knows for sure. And one of the first groups to react were like schools when it came to guest visitors. All of a sudden, every school is like, no more guest visitors. And so they're just at my tour just gets wiped off the table <laughs> and I have to go home with uh, with no um with no way of making money. Uh, well, I mean, I, I went back to my old job and just begged if they could take me back. Um, but yeah, so, so I spent uh, all of 2020 uh, working at my old job, which I was a writer for a media company mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, working on trying to crack the question of like, how can I make money as a kid's book author again? Because that's what I love. So that's one. Okay, that's one uh, in the professional life. And then another one that kind of is both the professional life and the personal life is in 20 er, in early 2019. <laughs> um, I, uh, I, 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 my, my wife left me, I was married, I was married for six years. 
uh, my wife uh, went and took a job uh, on Disney Cruise Line and a couple months later told me that she didn't want to be married to me anymore. Mm-hmm. And that was a huge um, it was a huge uh, shock for me because um, I, I, I man it's going to be hard to talk about, but, uh, but if you want to talk about it, I'm a pretty transparent person. Wow. Um, mm-hmm. yeah, that was, that was a huge hit. Uh, I had no idea that she was so miserable. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, I mean, I knew that we had problems, but I had no idea that she was as miserable as she was. And, uh, I, I just, to, to me, the, the thought of divorce was next to the thought of death. It was like, yeah, this is one way that my life could end. And then this is the mm-hmm. other way that my life could end. Yes. And, you know, there's so many people that have gone through a divorce or had a relationship situation that hit them really hard. And when you go through something like that, it affects every single other area of your life. It's not just your relationship. It affects, I mean, because you have common friends, it affects your finances. It affects every yes. single thing. I, I have a whole chapter of on that in my book and then special gifts for people that are going through that and free courses and things because it is such a tough journey. And sometimes for whatever reason, one person or the other isn't aligned. It, it, it's really not a representation of you or that other person. It just is what it is. And when you get to the point where you're able to know that something better will show up, that's more aligned for you, that's okay. But it's, it takes a while how long did it take you to rebuild after going through that? <laughs> uh, yeah. So it was an interesting time because um, from 2014 to 2018, I'm just busting my butt trying to figure out how to make being a kid's book author, a full-time thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm working for Disney as a performer all, mm-hmm. all through this time. And uh, I just keep hitting these like little wins where it's like, oh, I, I went and I toured this area and, you know, um, oh, if I if I if I line up my tour dates with their with their book fairs, uh, I, ma- I make more money that way. And just like little just discovering hacks, you know, that that worked. Um, but then uh, in 2019, uh, she had left. And at first it was just, she was leaving to go take a job that would have had her traveling and we would have seen each other, you know, weekly, but just a couple of days a week. Um, but all that time away, I fill the time with traveling Mm -hmm. and, uh, and all of a sudden I get discovered, uh, by a little network of schools in Miami and they just start telling all their principals about all the, the principals in that network about me. And it just, it, it just keeps uh, getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So, uh, and r- right around that same time is when she told me that she didn't want to be married to me anymore. So I am simultaneously experiencing this soaring off of my, of my entrepreneurial self into mm-hmm. success while um, personally, I feel like I am shattered and, it was just a weird time because I I'm literally like going into elementary schools to perform and read for the kids and, you know, do all the stuff that I do at the schools. What? And then as soon as I I come away from that, I'm basically a crying shattered mess. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. You know, that sounds dark time. (laughs) Sounds to me like that was your therapy. That was a lot of us are guilty. I know I was too of work therapy or where you can put all your efforts and energy into something where you don't have to think about what else is going on uh, and you don't have to grieve over whatever. You can just focus on the good and helping others. And that's beautiful. And it's, and then you have your time to heal when you're not doing that. And it's like, it gives you little breaks from the healing process. Yeah. I I would say for me, it was more a distraction than it was therapy. But what one thing that was nice is that all the touring was constantly putting me in different locations. And um, there was one tour that I did where I toured Arkansas. And I just made a point that after every school visit, I would go off into nature and just pray. Mm-hmm. And uh, oh my gosh, I spent so many days climbing mountains and crying and talking to God. <laughs> nice. Yes. 
And that, you know, we all need that in our life and that's okay. I think that for those listening in, if you have gone through a tough situation or are currently going through a tough situation, let that be okay. That time and space, sometimes going in nature or finding where whatever that is for you, whether it's yoga, nature, singing, whatever, and have that time to process, to heal, and also to think about your next steps. Because a lot of times when we're in a place of hurt or um, we want to be distracted, we may overspend or we may make decisions that are based on our emotions versus based on the decisions that we really need to make that make sense. <laughs> so I'm I would say I made a lot of I made a lot of decisions based on emotions. Yes. <laughs> in 2019. When- I was making a lot of money and being broke the whole time. Yes, that happens. And it doesn't matter if you're a, a billionaire. This happens to anybody going through a situation like that. It's the same story. Yeah. It is it's oh, a universal thing. <laughs> and, and I would say I would I would put a caveat around making a lot of money. I guess what I mean by that is I was I it was it was becoming the most well-paid job that I've ever had. Um, but uh, so th- this may surprise some folks. Disney does not pay very well its performers. <laughs> um, so please don't think that I was making a lot of money. Um, but I was it was the most it was becoming the most well-paid job that I'd ever had. And um and I was I was able to like eat more than ramen and eggs, which is what I'd mostly been surviving on. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> but also well, also have money for plenty of bad decisions. Right. I drank a lot of alcohol in 2019. There's this Bible verse. Uh, I'm a Christian, by the way, so you're probably going to hear this in in the conversation quite a bit. But um, I I was going through just a crazy up and down emotions and spirituality and everything. Mm-hmm. Um, there's this Bible verse and it, I would offend my Christian friends whenever I would share it, but <laughs> it says, uh, give wine to the one who is sorrowing and strong drink to the one who feels ready to die. <laughs> and I would say, I would say, Hey, I am just, I'm just applying the Bible to my life right now. <laughs> <laughs> Good use of it. You now that, that can be applied to anything. And when you think about, um, any religious studies, we can apply it to our own what serves us, but I know that you knew inside and your friends knew and it, you have a knowing that it's like, okay, but yeah, really. And it is really not the case, but yeah, but it, I, I yeah. knew, I knew it needed. I, I knew that what I was, I knew that plenty of the decisions that I was making weren't healthy, but I was in such a place emotionally. You like, I, I don't know too much about your your personal life, Sheila, and I can't wait to dig into it with you on the purpose of an entrepreneur. But uh, I, I would assume that you've gone through some serious pain in your life if this is the the the, the show that you've decided to make. Mm-hmm. And you can probably remember there's no, I, I well, I don't want to assume what it was like for you, but what it was like for me was there was no room for making wise decisions. Yeah. There was there was room for surviving. Mm -hmm. And just trying to address the pain and then sometimes just trying to feel the pain because there was a good while where I just felt like I was going numb. Very, very normal and very much a part of that process, the grieving process, Uh, very much so. And the, the reason I wrote the book and the reason I have this show is to help people when they're going through those points in life whether it's divorce, loss of a loved one, dealing with a career switch or shift like we've all had (laughs) this last year, whatever it is, reinventing yourself where you have to walk uh, down a different road and go through this process alone. And I don't want people to feel alone and that there are so many ways to get back on track. So like I created this method that I use to get myself back on track when my house burned down uh, in oh, 2017, geez. the Ventura fires. And I had just finished traveling for seven years straight, had a great time and, and did a whole bunch of uh, personal development fun and worked uh, on the road doing events and then lost my house, my cat and my car all in a few days. With wow. And it was, what do I do? And what I did to get back on track was I sat down and I wrote out the formula of what I always do. And it was kind of what I would want to tell my best friend going through something. 
Oh man, that, yeah. Uh, that <laughs> reminds me of something that I heard when I was going through this, which was, um, and I never heard, I, I think I probably heard it before, but I had never done it before. Yeah. And um, there's this podcast that I was listening to uh, where the guys are talk. at one point they were talking about um, an exercise that you can go through if you have a lot of self doubt, or if you just, you just think very low of yourself. Uh -huh. Um, and it's, you look in the mirror and you talk to yourself, like you're not you, like you talk to yourself, like you're your friend. Uh -huh. Um, and so you don't use I language, you use you language. Uh -huh. Like you literally, I literally look at myself. It sounds so weird. And for, for me, it was just the strangest thing in the world to start with, but I would look at myself in the mirror and I would just be like, okay, Timmy, you, and then I would just start talking. Uh -huh. And at first it felt so weird, but, um, it was surprisingly healing, <laughs> Wow, listeners, that is a beautiful application. If you, you know, for yourself or someone going through something to go to the mirror and love yourself and look at yourself as if it, you were your best friend or your closest sister, parent, whatever, and, and start giving yourself the advice you need to hear and the love in a beautiful way. I think a lot of times we have a lot of negative self-talk that happens yes. that may be a voice from maybe a parent or a teacher or something from the past that hopefully your amazing books erase that or stop that in their track so that we don't continue that pattern, but it does tend to happen. And you hear these, these other voices and it's like, well, that's not, that's not, I would never speak that way to my best friend. Wait a minute. Yeah. Yeah. I'm working yeah. on a kid's book right now called a kid's book about, or it's called a picture book about rejection. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it, it's inspired by my experience and, uh, it's literally meant to try to get across to a kid, the things that I needed to tell myself when I was going through this. And also the exercise of looking at yourself in the mirror. And I say in the book, I'm like, I know this sounds super weird. Uh, mm -hmm. it was really weird when I did it. <laughs> that is so beautiful. And now do you have children? No, 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 no. And I actually don't know that I ever plan on having kids. Uh, but for whatever reason, ever since I was a kid, I knew that I wanted to be a kid's book author. Wow. <laughs> yes, because I can just totally feel how good you are with with kids and looking at some of the books that you wrote. I just I mean, I had I have six children. They're all grown. I adopted three, three are mine. They're all mine. Right. And yeah. those books are exactly what's needed and what I would want my children to read. Those what made you decide to adopt? <laughs> That's a good question. So for me, I was in a very abusive situation growing up and my mother told me to leave home because it was so dangerous, so much, you know, broken bones and terrible things. So I left, they went from home to home, different relatives my mother was staying with. And so I left and I was homeless from 10 to 13 and a half. Then I found foster care. I emancipated at 15. I became a mentor. I ran gift stores that created training programs for kids in foster care. And when I had my first child, I was told I couldn't have any more. And so I wanted more. And so then I did foster to adopt and had three. That's then awesome. how interesting these things, this was a soul contract, a guided, God guided thing perhaps, that then I had my last two birth children that were supposed to be impossible. And so, and so that happened. And it's something that's always been in my heart to do. Uh, my daughter actually is a social worker um, with a girl's home now that helps young teenage girls that have babies already. And she's their counselor and she's only in her early 20s. And so it's something that in our family is just part of what we do to give back. And it's, it's yeah. really important to us. I, I love it. I um I don't know if I will adopt, but I have said before when people have asked me if I plan on having kids, I'm like, well, there's already a lot of kids in the world. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know that I really need to add any more. And it, for whatever reason, it's offensive to people. But to me, it just seems kind of logical. <laughs> yes. No. And it's, it's funny because I have like all these kids that I have. They're so diverse and different. The little rainbow of children that I have. And they, they're a lot of them are kind of leaning toward that. And I say, whatever form that takes in your life, whether you are adopt, adopting, fostering, just through your books, helping with other children, 
it's whatever comes to you that's right will be right. And yeah. it will be perfect and it will show up in perfect time. It may change. Um, and whatever it is, like I say, as um, I haven't had any grandchildren, they're all grown. I'm like, hey, what's up? But it's okay. However they show up, it's all good. And if they don't, that's okay. Because there's so many to help and be involved with on this planet. And it, it, it really is. Those children that I fostered to adopt are the same as my children. As yeah. far as I really believe it was a guided situation. It was beyond, it was something that was in the plan. Yeah. I, yeah. I love it. I mean, again, as a Christian, uh, that I just believe that that's the heart of God that he wants, he wants his heart is for adoption. So whatever, whatever I do with my life, whether I adopt myself or I just do something to impact the kids that are in the world right now that don't have parents. Um, I just believe that that is, there's not really a, a, a higher uh, mission that somebody could devote their life to. Yes. Now, do you have any books in the works or ways that you're helping children as far as dealing with crazy COVID? <laughs> I thought about it. I, I actually submitted one to an agent and uh, she said that um, the thing about COVID is it's evolving so fast that a publisher is not super likely to, to pick up a book that um, addresses it in the way that it is right now. Mm. So I guess it would have to, yeah, that's the thing about COVID. Um, but I, I mean, there's nothing really stopping me from doing it except that I have a bunch of other books in the works, but I did, I did tentatively write one out that was just like, uh, why do we have to stay home all the time? Yeah. <laughs> I thought that'd be a good title for a book. Cause it's probably how kids are feeling, mm -hmm. uh, depending on where you are. Um, but I wrote it when it was pretty serious quarantine. I'm not sure where you're located, Sheila. I'm in Florida where we basically treat the disease like it doesn't exist. Right. Right. Yes. And I, I know I have a couple of homes. So one's in California, which is very strict. And the other is in Las Vegas, which is less strict, but the schools are mostly still closed unless some private schools are allowed to be open. It's kind of weird. So there are a lot of children that don't get a lot of outside. You don't get to go out and play. <laughs> you don't get to do much. And yeah. it's real. I think it's really strict when I go home to California. It's ridiculous. It is so strict and yeah. it's hard on the kids. It's yes. hard. On everyone. Yes. The children feel this. They feel it. And I, I feel that as parents, adults, people in children's lives, that the energy we bring, how we show up, just think about if you're on a plane and the stewardess looks scared, you're going to be scared. Yeah. Even if you're an adult, <laughs> this is just yeah. the truth, right? So yeah. I think the same thing, we need to really show up in strength, in agreement if you're, you know, partners, married, what co-parenting, however you're doing that, uh, maybe you have relatives that agree differently, have an agreement, a discussion about what gets talked about around the kids or how things are presented. So you're on a common ground so that yeah. children stay grounded and they feel safe. They can have peace. And I think learning is so much easier for kids when they feel safe. Hmm. And there's some kind of, even if we don't love routines, <laughs> there's some kind of a structure of knowing there's a boundary and there's things are going to be okay. And yeah. Yes. I think it makes a good difference. Yeah. It's interesting because it's affected so many families differently. So you've got families that are now stuck together that are realizing how wonderful it is to spend so much uh, time together. And then you got families that are now stuck together that are uncovering all the problems that they're having with each other yeah. and uh fortunately for me i haven't really had too much of that um the people that i've been stuck with for most of this have been people that i've loved hanging out with but um it's got to be really hard if you are stuck with people that you wish you weren't didn't have to be so stuck with exactly one of the things i like to share on my show is about 211 have you heard of the 211 no Okay, so this is really important, and um, this isn't a sponsored thing, but this is something I always share, and that's 211 is available in every state in the United States and every province in Canada, and if you dial it or Google it, you will find a list of help 
and resources, whether that's getting food on the table, helping to get a job, um, help for veterans, seniors, help with childcare, lots of mental health help. And you, you know, you talk about living, what, what brought that to mind was when you talk about living in a home that maybe not isn't safe or where a situation isn't right or somebody is dealing with an addiction or there's an abusive situation going on, that's where you can get free help in any state or province in Canada or state in the United States. And I, I just feel really guided to share that because that's something just, just to post that in your work groups. If you run Zooms, share it at work. If you actually go to a physical job <laughs> again or with other parents, this is important. A lot of times people are afraid to ask for help when they need it. They won't admit it maybe to their friends. They want to save face, but maybe they really need the help this year. And that's okay. So if you do need help, ask for help when you need it or share that with someone that comes to you. Maybe you can't help them, but just giving them that information could make all the difference this year. Yeah, I agree. And I think people need community. And it's really hard to have community when there's a global pandemic. But we need it. Uh, to, to handle, to handle difficult problems. I mean, for me personally, when I was going through the divorce, I needed to be able to break down and cry in front of people. If I didn't have that, I don't know that I would be okay now. Right. Yes. Now that brings us back to church and whatever religion you are, if you're listening in or not, that's okay. But there's something about community, whether it's a church or whatever you belong to, that a lot of our communities are closed down right now. Churches, are you, do you have churches open in Florida? Yeah, we have churches open in, in Florida um, and they all have different. I, I don't know what the current restrictions are. There's a lot of churches that are closed and there's a few that are open and they're open with restrictions. We've been mostly doing church at our house. Uh, mm-hmm. But um, if I wasn't in a house <clears throat> full of people that wanted to do church at the house, I I'd, I'd personally I'd be like, OK, well, COVID aside, I, I need community. Yes. And a lot of different places. I I had favorite. um, I actually owned a church. (laughs) So I have a lot going on in my life. But I also have favorite yoga studios and and favorite other people's, you know, places of worship that we would all go together in, in California because it's very diverse there. And they're closed down for good because of the economy. And so it's really hard because when you think about going through grieving, going through a divorce, anything you're going through the healing process is in those, those steps, those traditions, the faith traditions of your family, of your friends, having them close together. It really helps. Now for my family and I, we lost my youngest son. Um, He was 22 and he had a heart condition called Wolf Parkinson White syndrome. He passed away uh, December 21st, 2019. Oh, wow. That was like, whew. You know, COVID's nothing. That, that for for our family, it was that was our like, the hardest thing in our lives. And going through that, our having a community and a place to pray and 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 having people around us surrounding us to to hold us through that time, and even people sending prayers and intentions and blessings and all that. I I really believe that we felt it. Yeah. Yeah, we felt it. And it was like when we couldn't walk, it carried us through. And yep. I believe that. And now maybe you don't believe in anything and you're listening in. And, you know, this isn't a religious show, but it can be <laughs> scientifically, scientifically. Now they have studies that show, my gosh, they put intention um, on water or different things across. And you'll see that the structure changes. Uh, the molecular structure of water will change when you put peace and love and different things mm. across. And there's all these scientific studies on prayer and meditation and how these things work for people and help. So we, you know, we need that more than ever in this time where we have so much that's uncertain. Yeah. 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 For for me personally, I just found, so um I was touring in Arkansas and a friend of mine, she just started taking me to different churches on Sundays. Cause I, I spent uh, uh, five weeks there. And so this was, w- this was at a point where my heart was pretty numb. Um, I just couldn't really feel any, I was starting to get to a place where I couldn't feel anything. So mm-hmm. I had, I, I had been drinking a lot 
um, the, the reason I started drinking so much was to help me just open up, uh, because, uh, you drink enough alcohol and it's just going to come out of you, uh, mm. all your, all your feelings. And so, uh, that's what I was doing at first. And then I, I was at a point where I was just, I was drinking so much and still going numb. And then I started doing other stuff. I was like, I would go to the gym and I would go, I'm going to work out until I, until I can't move anymore. Uh, just trying to literally trying to hurt myself um, so that I would be, so that I would be in pain so that I would feel the sensation of feeling things. This sounds so, I don't know. I, I think because I'm a three, I like hear myself talking right now and I'm like, you sound like a whiny little, uh, and we're on the air. So I can't finish no, that but you're <laughs> So spot on because everybody has like I would say 99.9% .9 of the people I've worked with and even myself going through my own divorce at one point years ago yeah I you know I might have done different things I didn't really drink but, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm not advocating for alcohol except I kind of in a joking way am pointing to the fact that there, it did it was part of the story it right. was part of the story. But what was so crazy where I was going with this is mm -hmm. um, so I'm in church. I would pray. I would, I would there'd be you know people worshiping around me and then I would just break down and start crying. And mm -hmm. I and I would start crying and then I would start sobbing and I would just be like bent over and sobbing. And I'm going to get emotional thinking about it now. Um, and the, the reason that it was so emotional for me is because um, when someone divorces you, uh, they're not just saying like, Hey, you know what? I think we should go. I think we should go separate ways. Like, you know, there might be some divorces that go that way, but, uh, not this one. Um, it was, uh, it was, I don't want you anymore, you know, kind of thing. And, uh, um, just the feeling of not being wanted and not being enough and not feeling like you're worthy of anything, uh, not, not feeling like, um, not feeling like someone, W will someone ever want me again? It, this sounds so petty to say, but in that moment, um, yeah. I did. Uh, I don't. I don't yeah. just want to bash her. That my goal is not to get on here and bash her, um, but in a very low place, feeling unworthy and uh, not not. I remember thinking like I just wasn't made right. I just wasn't made the right way because I wasn't made to be to be to be wanted like whatever makes a person wanted, I wasn't put together that way. Mm. Um, and, uh, just in church worship, worship going on all around me, I'm crying and I'm just hearing the Lord saying to me, uh, I, I like the way that I made you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, I would just break down sobbing. Yeah. Um, and what's cool is when you're in a church and you break down sobbing, everybody just puts their hands on you. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so they don't think that you're a weirdo. Right. And, you know, in society, we kind of tend to, um, like, have these crazy rules that it's not okay to have our emotions. Or, I mean, after losing my son, my daughter was like, gosh, my friends were upset with me. And I was because I was still grieving a month later. And it's like, hello. Well, that's just normal. And yeah. they haven't had that experience. You know, her younger friends didn't lose a loved one so close. So they don't, they don't have something to were, really. People were getting on your case for grieving a, a month later. Yeah. And I was like, you know what? A literal Yeah, literally, literally. And, and it was, it changed. It was like, oh, wow, wait a minute. <laughs> and it, it made her reassess her friendship circles a little bit and, and realize some friends are, you know, friends you work with that maybe go have fun with, but they're not really aligned on the value. Yeah. And it was probably such a good thing to happen at a young age versus later, but that will yeah. happen. And so when you find your peer group and your friends and you're in a church or wherever you're at and you find people that support you, and that means that they give you tough love sometimes when you know, when they need to just, you know, hold you and put their hands on you, that's one thing, but they'll also say, okay, now I'm going to help you out. Or when they see Dear Sheila. My mother has struggled with gambling addiction for all of my life. She has never been able to save or manage money. And she has been fired in the past for missing too much work 
because she would call out sick and then go gamble instead. She has not had a job in 10 years. Now my stepdad takes care of her, but she has been running him dry. Even though he works a full-time job, they are barely able to scrape by because she gambles most of his paycheck away. She has borrowed hundreds of dollars from me and will probably never be able to pay me back. My stepdad has a problem with saying no to her. He is in his 60s and has been having heart problems, and I'm scared that if something happens to him, she will become homeless. I am not in a financial position to be able to support her. She refuses to admit she has a problem, and I am afraid she will never realize that she needs help. How can I help my mother? Signed, A Concerned Daughter. Dear Concerned Daughter, there's a big difference between being concerned about your mother, who's now an adult, and enabling her to continue her gambling. It sounds like her husband, your stepdad, is kind of enabling her quite a bit. So the best thing for you to do is to understand that you have to have your own boundaries. Learning to have boundaries is very helpful. And then giving your stepdad and your mom the resources to help them. There's different programs such as Gamblers Anonymous and other resources out there to help your mom, but she does have to want help. And as long as your stepdad's helping her, she may just continue to spend his money or anybody else's money who's going to help her continue her habit. So she needs help finding new habits when she's ready. Yes. The best thing to do to help your mom, I would say, is start a savings program instead of funding your mom because your stepdad is there helping her maybe a little bit too much at this point start to set up a little fund where you just put so much away where if she does hit a rock bottom and gets into a help center or something like that at a certain point later in time you're able to help when you really need to and not in a way that would enable her but where she could get help. And there, there's resources, there's social security, and, and different things. So your mom is most likely not gonna become homeless. You have to decide how much you wanna be involved and how much helping can hurt. Sometimes a person has to get to the point where they're willing to ask for help. And in order to do that, they're gonna have to get to the point where maybe they do hit a, a bottom. And so that's a point where you and your stepdad could come together with maybe some other friends that, that your mom works with that know about her, her gambling and do an intervention where you talk and discuss how you're going to loan money or not loan money, what you will help with, and how you can help her to get new healthy habits. Maybe she was a runner or a swimmer or she was a dancer or singer, get her back into her hobbies and let her find out that there's life outside of her addiction. I hope this helps. There's plenty of resources in my book that, that will help you find ways to give your mom and your stepdad more resources. Just remember that you're the healthy ones. You and your stepdad are the ones that are not in addiction right now. So stay out of enabling and remember that being the healthy ones don't let the person that's in the addiction drag you and your family, your stepdad, you and the rest of your loved ones down with you because they will. They'll cost you everything if you don't take control. So remember who's in charge. You need to be in charge. You and your stepdad and all your loved ones be in charge now so that you avoid your mom hurting herself later and hurting everybody else that she loves. If she was in her right mind, she would want you to help her and make sure that she would never hurt you or your stepdad. As always, I wish you life, love, laughter, and light. And I have found something magical, something new that I am loving. At this stage in my life, I have been switching to the cleanest, best, healthiest makeup, shampoos, uh, facial products. So I did find a incredible uh, makeup line and they have been around quite some time. 
it is called beauty counter and if you go to beautycounter.com slash sheila mac s-h-e-i-l-a-m-a-c or sheilamac.com and at the top of the menu look for natural beauty that will bring you to the site where you can learn about the specials and give clean beauty a try I am just loving the difference it's making in my face. And one of the things that was really bothering me was a lot of the other products. I, I could not find eye makeup that wasn't irritating. So this is really like one of the few products I can actually wear around my eyes. And so I'm really loving everything. It makes my skin feel really clean and fresh. And so give it a try. Again, SheilaMac.com com slash natural beauty to learn more. All right. Welcome to a quick talk on education strategy today. Now there's something about education strategy today that is so important. Parents listening in, this is going to speak to you. Grandparents, this is also for you. Education happens more in the home and in the community than in the classroom so many times. And especially today where so many people have don't even have a choice. They're they're having to homeschool or they've chosen to homeschool due to our pandemic. <laughs> so anyway, education today. One of the things that you can do as the parent leader in the home for your children um, or children in your life is to be the leader. So one of my mantras is I'm a lifetime learner and a wisdom earner. And that means that I am continually learning new things. And I do that in front of my now grown children. I have six beautiful children. Um, and now that they're all grown, they are all still lifelong learners. It started at a really early age. So one of the things we did is we created a ritual at home when the children were very young, where we always had reading together. We had a reading time before bedtime. It started with before the terrible twos, even, you know, when they were babies, but by the terrible twos, it was the way to calm the children. So we would have a reading time, a story time, um, we would do our faith practice, and then it would be bedtime. And it was that calming ritual that happened every evening. Later on, when I traveled and the children weren't with me, we would actually get on a call. We didn't have Skype and Zoom back then. <laughs> we would get on a call and we would actually still read or talk about the day and they would read to me if I didn't have whatever book we were reading with me and we would have that family time. So there was a connection with learning and reading and story time and family time. And that that bond, it, it brought something where learning became part of the family. Um, activity. It was it was a sense of home and peace. And I think that made a big difference for my family and my children, although they chose to study different things and have completely different interests. <laughs> I have this diverse little group of six children of mine, um, three adopted, three from birth, but they're all mine. And, and we're, we're a beautiful, fun family, but reading for every single one is important to them and learning and applying what they learn and discussion. So we talked about things. We would talk about what's happening in school related to the stories we read or what's happening at work now that they're older. And, you know, we still call in <laughs> and have our time in the evenings, even now that they're all grown. Uh, so that's really important. You'll always be my baby, parenting teenage and adult children. And I dedicated an entire chapter in bootstraps and bra straps to parenting. So get your copy today on Amazon. Have you lost your job? Have you lost a loved one? Are you exhausted caring for your parents, for your kids? Well, you can find immediate relief when you read Sheila Mack's new number one bestseller, Bootstraps and Bra Straps. It contains the boots formula to move from rock bottom back into action in any situation, especially right now. If life has knocked you down, pick yourself up with bootstraps and bra straps. Get your copy at www.sheilamack.com today. If you are just tuning in, this is NBC's Sheila Mack Show here on KCAA Radio, the station that leaves no listener behind. I'm your host, Sheila Mack, 
and I have some news for you. Yes, you. I'm celebrating my third year now on the station and will be expanding the show to a global network as well. You may now find The Sheila Mack Show on all major podcasting channels. And if you have not subscribed to my YouTube channel, all the episodes are now available for viewing there as well. And I'm asking you for a quick favor. If you like the show, please help support the spread of this reboot channel on YouTube as well. My goal is to help as many people as possible through our interesting times to rebuild, reinvent, and reboot your business and personal life. I also wanted to share a little bit more about how I got here, what I do now, and how designing a business career and life on your terms is more than possible at any age or stage in life. I am an enterprisingly forward-thinking consultant, show host, and best-selling author. But how did I get here? Well, I began my career as an entrepreneur and property investment strategist back when I was 23 years young, when I boldly quit my government job with NASA JPL to open my first of five large gift stores while also starting to invest in property. I got to work with some of the world's most loved companies, such as negotiations on leases with Warner Brothers and winning trips to London as the top-selling Crabtree and Evelyn provider in the U.S. for multiple years. My stores were built on heart as I gave back to the community I came from. So now, some of you know this and some of you don't know this, but as a young girl with parents who were not well enough to care for me, I was homeless at age 10, then in foster care, where it was really hard to get a job while in the system. I finally emancipated at the age of 15 to start college early. While running my stores, I worked with a government program. Back then, it was called Job Training Partnership Act, making my stores an open source training site where close to 200 at-risk youth started their careers. Yes, I began my career helping business leaders and working professionals to design a life they love where they can have success in their careers and get to the business of life. See, a funny thing happened along the way. Uh, when I first opened my gift store, it was kind of crazy because I was this young upstart. That's what a lot of the store owners called me. Uh, my first store was in Montrose, California in this sweet little hometown uh, shopping park with other stores and restaurants nearby. And so I was the young upstart that didn't know what she was doing. At least that's what everybody said. And I didn't really care what they said. <laughs> I, at that age, you know, their opinion was like, I don't really care. So that that was probably a really good thing because I stayed focused on what I needed to do. And I had negotiated uh, to lease out a 5,000 square foot gift store that needed a lot of work. And I, I got free rent and uh, for about six months and I had to start making the rent, which was 5,000 a month, which was a lot of money back then, a dollar a square foot. And so I had to learn and relearn. I, I finally did hire quite, quite soon in the game. I did hire a marketing expert, branding expert, I guess back then. And uh, that lady really helped me to figure things out when I first started. And when you first start a business, especially when you're young, it was like <laughs> I had no idea what to do. But I needed to learn because my rent was going to start coming due every month. And over that time, I started having more success. I did crazy things like stayed open until almost midnight every night, along with the restaurants who were very close to my store, while everybody else closed shop at about 5 or 6 p.m. So I was making more money from the start, and I just really my store was to help my kids and the products I sold was whatever the community wanted. 
I sold lots of things to people in the entertainment industry. I worked with cruise ships. I worked with many different people in the community. And later on, the store owners actually came to me and asked me if I would consult them and help them. I actually started buying my other buildings because I didn't like the idea of paying rent for years and years and years and not building equity. So I did get my real estate license uh, through that and invested and bought my other four store buildings. And uh, lots of the other store owners worked with me, paid me <laughs> to consult and help them do what I was doing. And I didn't really even know it was called consulting. I just knew how to figure it out, I guess. And so that's how I started my career. And now, you know, I raised six children, all that, and now they're grown. And so I get to come to work every day and do what I naturally do best as an entre enterprising and forward thinking business leader. Through my show, courses, and live events, I guide entrepreneurs and working professionals like you through the profitable steps of building a business, creation to expansion, marketing from planning to implementation, wealth preservation through strategic planning and yes, real estate investing, and lifestyle design so that you can earn more while getting back to the business of living your best life. So I do invite you to tune in here uh, to KCAA Radio and also I would really appreciate it if you went to my YouTube channel, Sheila Mack Show, and gave a subscribe and a listen to some of your favorite shows. And I do have some other exciting things, including a free gift to thank you. So if you go to www.sheilamack.com, that's S-H-E-I-L-A-M-A-C, sheilamack.com, there you can get a free gift to get started on your reboot this year. And now back to the show.